forget, um, there is a sign-up sheet at the back. Please sign in. If there's something specific you want us to have a demo or a class on in the future, let me know. This group is for us. And without further ado, I'm going to let Jim take over from here. Thank you also for Gary, to Gary Canning for allowing us use of his facility. Thanks, Lori. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Jim McLaughlin. I live in Warner, and I've been carving for a long time. Um, I've never taken a course or a class in carving in my life, so everything I've done is pretty much by observing or reading books or um, just figuring things out as I, as I went along. Um, let's see. Um, I have a shop and I built in uh, 2005 in my house behind the garage, about 16 by 20. Nothing like this particular facility in any way, shape, or manner, but uh, it got me out of the garage so and out of the basement. Um, I joined the league, I think, in uh, or the uh, the guild in about 12 years ago, and I'm jury member of the of the league of New Hampshire craftsmen. Um, mostly, my woodworking that I do is for family, for friends. I do commission work, um, but it's essentially a hobby. I don't derive any, you know, I get some money and commissions, but it's just uh, whatever the, the person asking for the piece is willing to pay, what they think is reasonable, what I, I'm willing to uh, uh, charge them. So that's pretty much what, where I am. Um, I'm a hand tool carver. I have a Fordham rotary tool that I use uh, sparingly, usually for routing out uh, background and speed things up a little bit, but uh, I don't use it as a, I just don't have the confidence that Lori has or other, others have who have, are power carvers. So, uh, but it's the hand carving, the tools seem to be working for me pretty much. Uh, so relief carving, it's just pretty much all, all what I do. I do some uh, in the round, things. I've done a chess set, for example. Um, but most of what I do, I do signs. I've done a lot of uh, outdoors and indoor signs. Um, I've done uh, uh, different uh, use, incorporate carving into functional pieces of um, work, like trays or um, and signs and uh, that seems to be the where I am. So I'm, it's a two-dimensional with some uh, depth given uh, the um, taking out the background. Um, I would, uh, if anybody's interested in some really uh, good books on carving, I've got one by Chris Pye, uh, another one by William Schnoot, who was actually... Uh, um, in New Hampshire, he used to be in California, but he's now in uh, southern New Hampshire. The guy is amazing, so I would, I would uh, certainly recommend those uh, as sources of, of inspiration and uh, information. Um, the woods that I prefer, uh, or that I usually work, are hardwoods. Uh, cherry is my favorite, and then walnut um, I've used... Um, I had uh, made a mirror for one of my daughters. I used uh, curly, or not curly, bird's eye maple, thinking I would carve the entire circumference with oak leaves. Well, I got about a foot into the thing, and, and the problem with that wood is that at every quarter of an inch, the grain changes direction. So I, I stopped with just the corner uh, done, and the rest of it was just plain. So <laughs> it's a lesson learned there, I think. Um, I like cherry because it's, it's very dense, uh, it's a close grain wood, uh, and I love it. The, the, it's a beautiful wood once it's finished and uh, has taken on the, the pattern of, of the uh, ultraviolet light, I guess. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tools. Um, if you, if you uh, there's a, Chris Pye has a... Uh, a tutorial on on uh, uh, YouTube, which is you'll see him use all kinds of gouges. 
he must have thousand gouges because every every single uh, time the the particular radius of a curve that he wants to go, he'll go and get a different a different gouge, and uh, it's amazing to see what he does. And he's really good, but and I would recommend that, um, but it's not my my style, I guess. Um, I do a lot with pointed uh, carving knives, and I do have you know I have several of these. Um, I also have an assortment of gouges, file gouges from that I got from Woodcraft. Uh, what I really like uh, especially are these palm tools that file puts out. Uh, they're a little expensive, but um, they're, they are really easy to use. Um, and I find that, uh, you know, that's, I would recommend those to anyone thinking of uh, Getting into this um, for detail work, I've I've got some of these um, dock work. I think what they call it, dockyard tools. They're very small. Okay, so these are the guys that if you're doing some really detailed work, um, these are very very useful. Um, what else I've I've got a couple of mallets that I use occasionally, um, particularly if the wood is giving me a hard time. And uh, what else? Oh, I would encourage anybody to ask any questions any, at any point in, in this uh, presentation. I'm sorry, I, I yeah. didn't hear the name of those micro tools. They're file, P F E I L. I think, and they're sold by Woodcraft exclusively in this country. Um, they're palm tools. They're called palm tools. So, Jim, I keep thinking Christopher Pie is a wood turner carver. Am I wrong on that? With John I don't know that he turns. Okay. Yeah, I think he's principally known internet, you know, as a as a wood carver. Okay. He's in the UK. He's in that, right? Pardon? He's in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, he's a Brit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, these are the um, palm tools I mentioned, uh, just so people can see them. Um, let's see here. I also use dental tools on some some of the things that I've detailed work, particularly on the uh, uh, the. Um, chest pieces that I made. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't bring those because those are more in the round examples of wood carving, so I didn't bring those, but I, I use uh, um, those dental tools occasionally. Another set of tools I find really useful um, are files, and the ones I like best are those made in Switzerland. You can, on, you can go online and find there's a lot of files either Indian or Chinese, not to knock them, but I've had the best luck with uh, with Velorb. I think it's uh, Swiss-made files. And the number two grit is, I found the best uh, for, um, I think it goes from zero to, I don't know, some other number, but number two is the one I've, I've had the best luck with. On the dental tools, do you grind them, the points, to special ways? No, I just, you, I have a bunch of them. I use whatever. I Actually, there's one that I, I got at a yard sale years ago at a flea market. That's, that's the one I use almost always, all the time. It has a sharp edge, and I, I could sharpen it, I guess, but I, don't, I haven't had to. So they're well-made well, well, well steel. Um... And then, of course, sandpaper on occasion, uh, depending on the project. Um, so I think maybe I'll just move to uh, sharpening, which is one of those things, the necessary evil in any woodworking, as I'm sure if you all had some experience, it's either more or less important. I think in wood carving, it's the most important thing. Um, and there are a whole a host of ways of sharpening. You can take, uh, I think Mike DiMaggio was demonstrating a Tormek at the, uh, at the Sunapee Fair. And 
I mean, if you want to pay 800 bucks for a machine, that, that's the one to get. If you wanted to get that kind of uh, really great uh, finish and sharpness without uh, and much, too much handwork, that's, I guess, I don't have one, so I, I can't really say I have experience with it, but I do have a, a machine called a, a Coke, K-O-C-H, that Woodcraft put out. It's, it's got four different, uh, it's like a, um, uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> it's a grinder, like a grinder, but it has four different uh, wheels and they're made of some uh, material that you, you uh, charge with uh, uh, some kind of, a, uh, the kind of, yeah. And uh, they will not, they will not uh, burn the tool. They don't, the material is such that it, it does it, and it's really for finish, finishing off the, the blade once you're, you've got it pretty sharp. Um, Jim, do those work for the power um, sharpeners? Do they work for V tools and that type of thing, or not as well as a straight uh, Probably not as well. I don't know. I, as I said, I only have experience with this one, and it, mm -hmm. it would work with that. I don't know about the, I'm sure the Tormac would would be uh, able to be uh, yeah. useful too. John, they recommend that um, if you get a, uh, one of these turning sharpeners and whatever, if they stay under 750 RPM, it won't burn the tool. Okay. If anything over that, then you have a chance of risk of burning the tool. Right. Then you've got to have a variable you speed. You know, basically with a washing machine motor, <laughs> you, you know, you have to get some pulleys to get that speed down so it doesn't right. tear something up. Oh, good. Thanks for that. Jim, what's the steel? Uh, you know, with their assessment, HHS and all those 20 steels and four, what kind of steel is in those? You know, I, I don't really know. If maybe That's somebody else. Whether it burns or not is one of the real questions. Uh, or is all your hand sharpening I should back up? I, as I said, I do mostly hand hand sharpening, so I don't have a lot of experience with getting to that point where it's going to burn. Um, for as far as hand sharpening, I I really like uh, using the the um, wet the wet and dry paper of different grits. You know, six hundred, four hundred, up to two thousand. I mean, you can really and you just um, you know, spray with water and yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> so basically, uh, <clears throat> you get it wet and with several passes of the on the uh, the blade, whatever, and you can it'll accommodate almost any any kind of a blade that you're using. Um, Yeah, I start. Well, I should start with a six hundred, and then move up to the, this is twelve hundred, and then um, after that, use uh, a uh, a leather strop. And there are this is one I've got. Uh, just just leather, basically. It's a piece of leather that glue it to this wood, and give the. Give a couple passes. Is there anything applied to the leather? In this one, no. A friend of mine who went through the, uh, who's had a lot of education in that, he said, you don't need to put a, that's, that's his thing. Now, now going then in the other direction, this little, this little guy is very useful, and uh, I use a, uh, the, uh, whatever this is, I know. It, ha it could accommodate uh, different um, turn, uh, different radiuses of tools to get the inside, and then for the outside work. It's very handy. It's very handy. Yeah. What's that made out of? Well, it's wood. It's wood, basically, and it has a leather uh, top to it and leather on this side. Now, the, I know you can you can use um, other pieces of leather to make different. You can make your own kind of thing with this, with leather. So do you do that at a certain angle? Because it looks like it's almost flat. Well, 
this is a very sharp tool. I mean, the edge is very sharp, so it didn't, you, you know, um, you're basically getting the, uh, the cutting edge is what you want to do. You don't want to tool it too much because it, you just put a, a, a small edge and it breaks down too quickly. You want to keep it as flat as possible. Yeah. Okay. And of course there are uh, oil stones um, and diamond uh, back, diamond uh, cutting or sharpening um, things. There's ceramic. I like this particular one. I, I, I use quite often. It's a ceramic. Doesn't require any oil or anything. It's um, again. It's going to be uh, uh, very useful if you're uh, quick. You know, quick uh, way of sharpening. This is a. It's called, It's a fine fine grain. I think it might be 800. I think they have three. This is um, made by Spiderco. I think they have three different grids. I think this is right in the middle. I think a lot of people, me included, that are sharpening their tools, especially when you get into dowries and tools, you're so afraid that when you sharpen it, you're actually going to dull it. Is there a, you know, a way that you can do you just look at the angle when you're sharpening, sharpening on the stone or mm -hmm. so that you don't actually dull your tools that are sharpening? Well, it's, it's a, I think it's a matter of experience and just... You just want to, yeah, you, you don't want to make the bevel too much. You're going to, the last bit of sharpening is just working on that, that little, the, the edge that's going to be in contact with the wood and cutting. So, um, it's just a matter of practice, I if guess. I, if I could add some Yeah, please. I, uh, I use only a leather straw. And uh, I use a paste that I get from MDI, which is a six or eight hundred grit. It's like motor oil, you just spread a little bit on it. And I've been using the same tools for 15 years. And um, I've, it's the only sharpening I have to do. It just, uh, every once in a while, when I feel it starting to get dull, I'll just drop it on, on, uh, on a leather strop that I have that's about 12 inches long. And as long as I hold it flat, I do it eight or 10 times on each side. And I'm ready to do business again. I don't even need to go to stones. Uh, because basically that keeps it sharp enough until it mm. breaks down. Um, and it saves a lot of uh, a lot of extra effort trying to, trying to do it. Yeah, great, great. That's a great idea. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, finishing. Um, it depends on. Uh, what it is your the, the piece of you work you're doing where it's going to end up if it's indoor or outdoor if you're doing a sign for outdoor then i've used a product called and you want it to be natural wood i've used one called um, outdoor oil by general and that seems to work pretty well although almost anything outdoors like that after a while it's going to yeah, have to really redo it. And uh, the uh, outdoor oil is, does actually penetrate into the wood, so that part of it is good. And I've, I have a sign in town that I periodically go back and recoat. And uh, it's getting darker. So that's the problem with the, 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 the wood. It was white oak, and uh, it does get dark. So what I've re Did you yeah. only seal it if you were going to paint it? Well, that's see, that's what I'm. I'm moving to painting. Any sign I'm doing outdoor now, I'm, I'm I just paint it with good household paint, and I found that that's. Have you ever tried gold leafing on, on signs? I uh, have, yes, indoor signs, but not not outdoor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's that's another another. So, uh, and then if you're doing uh, any kind of a um, product or a project that's involving uh, food related, it's going to be in the, used in the kitchen, uh, like a tray or a cheese board or something like that, you want to make sure you're using um, food safe finish 
probably uh, mineral oil and, and uh, beeswax. Is, you can make this stuff up or you can buy it. And there are different, lately I've got a, I got a product that's, um, um, tell us it, uh, <laughs> drawing a blank. It's, um, so, uh, this is uh, Murphy's oil. It's uh, beeswax, canova wax, and uh, yeah. It's mineral oil, Yes. It's pharmaceutical grade. If you I buy it at buy it in a drugstore. Uh -huh. Right. Right. Oh, really? right. I got I got a lot of kitchenware and uh, my rule is never use a finish that has any smell at all. Mm -hmm. If it has like in the carnauba, for example, I would never use that. I would not use any finish on kitchenware that has any smell whatsoever. How about walnut oil? Can that be used? Can you smell it? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 the beeswax is the stuff that smells. Okay, yeah. then I wouldn't use it. Yeah. If you can smell it, <coughs> use it. So what would you recommend? Mineral oil. Just mineral oil? Yes, it has no smell. Mm -hmm. See, all that oil is good because it's, if you get it heated, takes the nut proteins out, so anybody with nut allergies will not be affected. Hmm. The, the thing with the walnut oil is it dries hotter. The, the mineral oil doesn't really dry, right? It's, no, it's already a million years old. And it's, never <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's never. You know what it is? It's a liquid form of gasoline, and it's made from petroleum. It's and it's so highly refined. That it has no odor and no smell. It's totally not toxic. Yeah, it's very good stuff. You know, generally used to make a uh, thing yeah. they call salad <coughs> really now old. Right. Which they, and the FDA says if everything dries, it's food safe. And that's in contrast to what we're talking about here. Right. That old thing supposedly is. I guess you could use olive oil too and stuff like no, that. No, no, don't you ever use a vegetable oil because oh, really? it gets rancid. Oh. It develops a smell later and becomes sticky. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, I've tried all these things. It bounds. It's a lot of smell. It always came back to the Absolutely full yeah. cool. yeah, I, I have used, I've got some recently oh, a walnut oil that was recommended by a spoon maker. And that seems to be uh, okay. I'm not crazy about it, but it seems to work pretty well. Um, I have some I have some lilac that I'm gonna make spoons out of it, and I just uh, I wasn't sure what you know what oil, but I made a lot of spoons in my days, but um, I don't remember what I put on them years ago. Yeah. <coughs> See Dan Dustin, he'll tell you. <laughs> um, and I thought he talked a little bit about shop. Considerations. Um, <clears throat> I used to sit down while I was carving for a long, long time, and I started getting backaches. So I basically said, I'm, I, I follow somebody's advice <clears throat> to stand up while I'm carving. So I built this particular carving bench that sits on my big bench, and uh, I have no problem with my back. So I pass it on for what it's what it's worth, but. Because um, then, then your issue of your your feet and your <laughs> other parts of your anatomy come into play. Um, and I have I don't if you're do, depending on what you're doing, you, you probably uh, want to invest in some other tools, some machine tools, and you all probably have different stages of of uh, those kinds of. Of things, if you you know, if you're serious about making products that you can uh, carve into and, and have find useful. Um, so anyway, I, I thought I'd spend a little time doing a, the actual demonstration. Um, this is a Celtic cross. It's one of a set of six that I'm wa I'm making right right at the moment. I've done two, completed two, and sent them off. This one is almost, almost finished. Um, it, it started out life as a piece of, of black walnut that was given to my 
my wife's stepmother by her brother, who was in the lumber business in, in Michigan. And it's about um, 40 inches long by 20 inches wide and uh, almost eight quarters thick, just about. Anyway, she used it as a tabletop on her deck for quite a few years, which didn't do it any, any good. Anyway, I, as at the, her passing, the, at the funeral, I talked to uh, her brother's daughters, and they, they wondered if there's something that I could make out of this piece of wood that they, it was sort of meaningful to them. So I, I was able to get six blanks out of, <clears throat> out of this one piece of wood, and uh, I'm making these for, for the daughters and, and other family members. So um, it's, it's a project that involves about 35 hours of work on each, each one of these guys. Uh, as I said, I've got two done, and I'm working on, the, this is the third one right here. Uh, it's black walnut and uh, beautiful wood, beautiful wood. Um, Jim, how often do you have to um, strap your knife when you're cutting that uh, Probably every 15 minutes, more or less. Yeah, it depends. You can tell when it starts to need to be sharpened. That's it's a matter of experience. And, uh, but that's kind of a, a rule of thumb, I would say. What did you use to cut down the, the two holes? I saw you do a drill press for the holes, but what did you use to cut back the circle? Did you use power or was that all by hand? I used some power tools, yeah, with a, a small diameter uh, carbide tip. And uh, as I said, that, but you don't want to go too far because then all of a sudden you've, the, 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 res, the remainder, what's uh, showing from of that tool is going to, show up in the carving, which you don't really want. So this is Celtic knotwork, which is kind of my, I guess my uh, passion in a way. Um, one of our daughters is a graphic designer, and about maybe 18 years ago, she for Christmas she gave us a pen and ink drawing of our name surrounded by Celtic knotwork. And I thought that was really cool. I really like that. So. Uh, I started incorporating that into a lot of the work that I was doing. Show this book. Huh? Show them this book. So, um, this is uh, probably the best uh, tutorial on, on how to uh, lay out uh, Celtic knotwork. And uh, it's, um, there's actually I have two books, one by Ian Bain, who is the son of George Bain, who did the original work on this. And Ian wrote this to kind of correct his father's. He didn't think his father explained it quite well enough, so he, he, he went about making that. Uh, I've, um, so I, I, we're gonna show you some of the work that I've done, and uh, I've done uh, a bunch of projects for a church in Dublin, Ohio, and uh, all, all of which are very much uh, Irish and Celtic oriented. So, so let me let me uh, start. Basically, the the process involved of doing this involves laying it out. And I, what I do is I use uh, when I, I the the design is done on paper to fit the the work, and uh, I then use carbon paper underneath that and trace out the design with a pencil. So once I've done that, I saw another, I think another um, tutorial on wood carving by somebody on uh, YouTube and he would take the paper image and glue it down to the work and then start carving right through the paper. Eventually then he'd strip it off, but when he was finished, I guess that's another way to do it. Um, Does carbon paper, Jim, show up fairly decent on sharp like walnut? Uh, it's it's good. I mean, you have to go back over it once once I've done that initial tracing and darken up the the uh, lines. You can get a white carbon paper now. So I think um, Michael's has it. Um, that the ink comes out white instead of black. Which yeah. Would be nice on the dark that would that would have been helpful. <laughs> 
<laughs> I may have to go there. Huh? It's quite a fine carbon paper. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. What about the um, paper that they use for tracing mills for um, selling? Tracing paper? Yeah. Uh, well, it's tracing paper, so it would right, but it come out on the. You can trace through something to trace on it, but then you have to. You have to be able to transfer it. You can't to transfer it. You can't put that right onto. You could, I guess you could. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, you mean gluing it down and then cutting through it? Or is that what you... Um, the kind that I'm familiar with, you can just use pressure to transfer that paper. Okay, so it's transfer paper. Well, it is a transfer yeah, paper, but it go, you can, I think you could put it directly on. Well, you, you, just, you just put it face down and rub it. Right. And it transfers the pencil right onto the wood. Mm. Right. Mm. And unlike carbon paper, it erases very easily. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> paper is very hard to erase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, one way or another, you got to get the image that you're, you you want to carve onto the onto the wood. So, um, <clears throat> and the the thing about uh, particularly about Celtic knotwork is that there's a uh, each each rope or each line has to go over one of its neighbors and then under the next one, over and under. You cannot have it go over two in a row or under two in a row. That that would not be correct. So um, let's see here. So let me just I take my glasses off since I can't can't see what I'm doing with the, with them on. So the uh, the important thing is to can you see that? I don't know if you can see. Am I, in the, am I on my own way? Is that working bad? It's just small. It's small. Huh? Yeah. If you want to, you can stand up at the table. Can you zoom in on the camera? Can you zoom in on the camera? Can you zoom in on the camera? No, I think it's like... I have to get on the top. No. No. <laughs> so this is where I'm I'm just yeah about the the finished pro, uh, this bottom section here I didn't I haven't finished so that's what I'm doing right now the rest of it is pretty much complete probably have to go through it and do some burnishing and uh, finish but it's basically done. Yeah, as I remember, you never you never sand it very rarely. Do Sorry. No, as I remember, you rarely sand it. Right. Yeah. I don't I don't sand. I think having the tool marks is one, one thing that lends interest to the piece. Are your, uh, is the hollows flat bottomed or are they coming in at an angle? They come in at an angle, yeah. And you could see it better if you're up closer. But. What do you do if you make a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> what is the question? I don't make what do you do if you make a mistake? If you make a mistake, yeah. how, do you, how do you recover? Well, uh, your after you said a few words of uh, <laughs> discouragement, um, I haven't, really, I really haven't made too many mistakes. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's very difficult. I, there's one point in here where there's a, a slight nick. I think it came from a saw blade, but when I'm done, I'll use, I think, some uh, um, that better. wax. Yeah. Call it wax. I'm sorry, use a what? Wax? Wax. Yeah, and the sticks of um, different colors of wood to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And one thing uh, I found useful is when you're working with these tools, is to hold the tool toward the toward the uh, the working edge, as opposed to back back farther. I think that works for almost any any tool that you're using hand tools with. Right, right, yeah. Thumb guard, right. Um, again, it's, it's just a matter of getting comfortable with, with the uh, tools you're working with. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've, sometimes I've, uh, I mean, even holding one of my hands is against the, the edge, but uh, to get better leverage and... So you come to a, a sharp point at the bottom of it. Okay. And if you're, <clears throat> this is fairly deep, I mean, because the, the wood itself is, there's a lot of wood here. Um, you could make them shallower cuts if you wanted to. Sorry, could I ask a question? Would it be possible, would you feel comfortable to pass that around just briefly so we could just take a quick? Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and you could pass around. Here's a, you know another example of a sign um, I made, and that's a little shallower, but it's. Yeah. Well, is the, the first step is to is to get the background out so that everything is at the same level, and then it's a matter of of uh, cutting into the the pieces, the sections that are going underneath. The, it's a neighbor, and then once that's done, then you have to, you can. Uh, you could do a, a number of things with what uh, to make it finish. You could make it make the uh, tops flat, so it's like a ribbon, or rounded, like I'm doing the way I'm doing the, the Celtic cross. Uh, in this particular one, I used um, a double. I, I put a groove down the middle of each one of the uh, knots, so that it gives it a little more interest. What else? <clears throat> so before I, uh, oh, go ahead, Chris. Just a little bit of curl. Have you, do you notice any uh, uh, difficulty working the wood because of the curl? Um, not much, no, no. It's not that accentuated. It, it's yeah. an interesting piece of wood, though. Um, this is a. Uh, we lived in Philadelphia for six years, and I got interested in the Pennsylvania Dutch art, and so I made this particular uh, bird, and I, I signed it on the back and dated 1972. So it's 50 years. <laughs> that's another. That's another time, but. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, yeah. Ian Bain's son. Ian Bain's is the, he's the son, and his father his father George. This is George's book. So. And I think you could still get these on eBay. Some of these uh, doc these books. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. So you said you like maple and walnut. I like cherry. 
cherry more than I. I don't know for whatever reason I haven't haven't used maple very much. Yeah, butter. Yeah, I would recommend butternut to anybody starting out. It's uh, yeah, it's like pine. Yeah. Do you ever uh, basically the design and fret work and then use it to basically glue it to your uh, panel instead of lowering the surface? I haven't. No, I've never done that. Okay. I mean that's yeah. There's a lot of ways to make things go a little bit quicker, I guess, but. That uh, that those words on that plaque, "Cade uh, Mila Falsha," which means a hundred thousand welcomes, mm -hmm. in Irish. Well, it's, well, it's yeah. Do you prefer a certain grain? Like some folks would prefer maybe quercetin, or do you, does it? Is it not really matter that much? To you? I don't think it matters too much. It's hard to get that sort of thing. I mean, I don't think you're, we're looking for integrity or strength in any way, but uh, I, uh, we were talking about um, turning. I'm not a turner, I don't have a lathe, but I did have a project with a friend of mine, Stephen Fry, who uh, lives in Hopkinton. He's a really talented wood turner, and he, he proposed, he says, I'll make, he would make two cherry bowls and a I would decorate each one with Celtic carving. Then he would keep one, and I would keep one. So that's what that was that a good style? deal. That, is that the style that you basically follow as Celtic? Yeah, I, recently, yeah, in the last few years, and I don't, not always, but that's depending on what the client is looking for. Um, but anyway, so I've had some experience with working with turned objects. And uh, that was that was tough, particularly when you got to the end grain area of mm -hmm. and trying to you know it's totally tough different, huh? Tough to yeah, I'm sure it is, but it, it's totally. Uh, Jim, what was, what was the wood that you used for this piece? That's cherry. cherry. Yeah. On this tray, did, did you carve the base and the bottom piece? In other words, yep. I, I don't recall exactly. I probably, I probably uh, started out using uh, maybe a drill press with a Fordham or, um, you know, and uh, to make things go more quickly. But I finished it off with carving. Yeah, it's all carved. So. I saw you working on one of those trays a few years ago up at Sonic. Yeah, I did. Right, yeah, that one I think. Jim, I've heard stories from people at another carving club that if you like, sand the item down or power carve it and then you use your hand tools that you're going to dull the knives faster. Is that like an old wives tale? That mm -hmm. if you sand something and then you use the knife, it's going to dull it faster. I never, I've never heard that, but um, that could be true. Yeah, it depends on the kind of wood. So if you have a very porous wood like oak or ash, mm -hmm. then the sanding grit will go into those pores and remain there, and when you try to wow. turn or carve over it, it will dull the tool oh. very quickly. Okay. But with maple no, or cherry, not so much. Because huh. it's, it's a tighter grain. Right, there isn't room for the grits to lodge. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I, I noticed you have micro gouges. Yep. <laughs> well, it's same with the same with any any tool. Very I mean, small, very small. I mean, you know, with um, yeah. Do you ever use a carving mallet for? I do. Oh, I see. I have one. I have a, a, a larger one too. It's similar to one that's around here. You know, I use that on occasion. Um, so, you know, it's. If you're doing, if you talk about Celtic knot work, yeah. um, I use the my the printer to enlarge and reduce um, images, and in order so that it fits within the space that I'm trying to incorporate. So, but it's you know, just a matter of judgment. Um, yeah, this is a. 
kind of a sign. This is for my one of my uh, sons-in-law, who's a fanatic for the uh, Manchester United football team and the Premier League, and he has his basement is decorated in all kinds of memorabilia. And that's, he asked me to make him a sign, so that this. That's what this is. This is the Premier League logo in the middle. And Fergie is, stands for Sir Alex Ferguson, who was a longtime coach for that club. And so he named it Fergie's Basement Pub. And one of his friends says it's, it's much better than the, the, the basement deserves. But <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is a... Almost, almost a, um, well, it's very high, I guess, high relief. Uh, carving the, of a sign for the uh, Main Street bookends in Warner. And it, it shows the, um, I, I based it on a, a design uh, that, that they use for their, uh, their place of business. And it shows the kids that were the owner's sons and daughters when they were like four years old. So it's uh, an iconic image. That, How big is that? Um, probably that, that long, yeah. Are you using acrylics or oils? Um, paints? the paints, I, I followed a, uh, recommendation or a, a process that involves putting a sepia tone on everything to start with, and then before that even dries totally, putting, uh, oil colors in that sort of, um, the wood woodness f shows through, and it's uh, it's a technique I think that uh, European wood carvers have used for for years, going way way back. What is the base again? The base coat? It's a it's a sepia. It's a sort of a light brown um, wash, almost a wash okay. that um, gets incorporated into the wood, and then the uh, it it affects the final colors that you're putting on it. It gives it a nice tone to it. Do you have close-ups of the uh, figures? Pardon? Do you have closer images of the figures? Um, I don't know if we could do that. What? No, I, that's the file. Is what that's it is. okay. Yeah, I think that's it. So is that kind of carbon um, much more difficult or less difficult than what you're doing now? Um, mm. Much more difficult. I mean, it's almost a full figure. You really you're carving these these images in the round, almost. So, yeah, that was that was tough. So it's like sculpting. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I did that. This was like the last, the second um, project that I had to get in in order to get juried at the, with the league, and so it passed muster, I guess. <laughs> Um, this is a house sign I did for a person, again, up in, in, uh, out in Ohio, uh, for their house, gave their, their names and when the house was built. And Go ahead. Uh, this was a sign I did for a local restaurant in Warner, who they no longer have changed hands, so it's no longer up there, but it's uh, the local and this was, um, I was fortunate the, the uh, owner was able to get a full-sized uh, image of what he wanted and it was in, in color as well. So that made life a lot easier in terms of putting it, transferring it onto the, uh, the finish of the wood and getting that laid out. Um, Go ahead. Uh, this was a sort of a friends of ours wanted to, me to make them a sign that it said stressed is dessert spelled backwards on the <laughs> So I, the basically only carving is the, is the ice cream, the banana split there on the, on the left. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, I've done a number of mirrors and uh, this being one of them, incorporating Celtic, Celtic knotwork all the way around. Go ahead. Uh, another one, a little more involved with that 
Cade Miller Falsia inscription at the bottom. Um, oh, this is, um, I've, I've tried to, uh, in building furniture, I've incorporated Celtic knotwork in a number of those. In each corner, it's hard to see at this scale, but uh, each corner has a little uh, image of, of um, dragons. Okay, this is the bowl I, I mentioned before that gave me some heartache in doing the end, end grain, but um, this has birds, a motif of birds going around the sun. And there's a, I have, you can look at some of, a lot of these in this book that, notebook that I have with uh, different uh, images. So, uh, this is a sign I did recently this summer for a woman who's starting a business in Bradford called Soul Source. And she asked me to, she gave me a tiny little image of what she wanted and uh, I was able to blow it up with the uh, printer and incorporate this montage of, of uh, sections of the sign and it turned out reasonably well. Um, the letters are all raised in the sign. It's hard to see for this scale, but um, I did use a router to take out most of the background material, get it down to a point when then I finish it off with the gouge. So you do get that texture. Uh, here's a basically pretty close to what I'm doing with a Celtic cross. Uh, this is a, a wedding box I did for a woman who was a client of my daughter's in Texas. She had two sons who were getting married within a couple of months of each other, and she wanted somebody, it ended up being me, to make two boxes. Each one would incorporate, would, would have room for a bottle of scotch and a bottle of wine and two glasses. And her idea was that each couple would write a narrative of why they found the other attractive and what was so great about them. And then they would... Inc put these, these, uh, this paper, uh, this narratives into the box and put it away. And so down the line, when things got a little dicey, the idea was to open up the box, read what they had said about the other person, and that would re-enkindle the love that they had. And if that didn't work, they could start drinking, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you open that 20 years after? <laughs> No, no report on the success or failure at this point, but um, you know this is a, another. Uh, it's a, incorporated a piece of um, tile as a cutting board and a cracker cracker board into a single unit. That, uh, and this is the board that was passed around the cracker board. Go ahead. Uh, this is. These are the chess pieces I mentioned earlier, um, some of them. Uh, I finally finished, I think two years ago, I finished the last one. Um, the first one I did in 1991, so I could tell you some, some sense of how long it took. These are, yeah. uh, recipe box, I made a few of these. Um, basically, the, it accommodates uh, six inch um, pieces with the different recipes that the person might have, and then you can, they can stand them up between the fingers when you pick the, re the recipe that you want to make that day. Uh, another serving dish. Uh, this was um, offered in an auction for the library in town, uh, raised money for the different projects. And this is... Um, a mantle I did for a woman in Hopkinton, a friend of mine. It's uh, unfortunately I, I I did have a problem with it and putting it and securing it, and I didn't secure it well enough because it fell off the stupid mantle. But uh, I was able to get it back up and in place, and it's still there. So that, is that cherry or uh, That's butternut, actually. This is butternut. 
and, and I incorporated, there's oak trees all over this property, so that was the, the motif I use and carved oak leaves um, across the front. This is that mirror I mentioned that I started out doing the oak leaf all the way around and ended up making it just in the upper left-hand corner. <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, this, uh, this is in, using incised uh, lettering. Mo uh, mostly I've, lettering I've done is raised lettering, so you carve away the background and, and, the, and the lettering stands out. This I did the, the other way around, which is more common, I think, um, incising the, the letters and painting them. No, I don't. I, I don't. I think they're probably. It's probably easier. You can do it faster, I think, mm -hmm. as opposed to carving out all the background and letting the lettering did stand you out. Color those letters. I did. Yeah, I put. I painted them. Mm -hmm. Just a bit of paint. Um, and here's another a sign that uh, in in Warner for the local uh, Jim Mitchell Park. Uh, I've done two signs similar to this for that uh, community facility. Uh, this one I, um, well, I painted. Uh, this was um, one of a number of um, signs that I've done for St. Bridget's Church, St. Bridget of Kildare in uh, Dublin, Ohio. Dublin, Ohio makes a big deal on Irish. I mean, they have an Irish festival that is the biggest in the country, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyway, this, uh, this church is uh, really amazing. They, they put a pastoral center, that was the first image for uh, dedicating that. Then they read it. The next thing they do was they enlarge the church by 50%, and then this is a rededication plaque I did for that and uh, shows the, uh, their iconic image of St. Bridget. And this is where I, I did use uh, gold leaf for the lettering. That makes it stand out. Uh, this is uh, the hall and the pastoral center was named for the Monsignor there. And uh, they asked me to make a sign identifying that. So, um, and this was just one of the uh, small sign I did for the, the uh, entranceway. 100,000 welcomes is something, uh, you know, sort of their, uh, something that they have a lot. Huh? Is that gold leaf too? Gold leaf on Yeah, that. gold leaf on that, yeah. And that's where they, they have it at the church. So they welcome new visitors to the, uh, to the facility. And finally I did a, a more elaborate Celtic cross. This is about so big, it's um, a little bit more elaborate. Um, a woman in town asked me to make a sign for their cottage up in Sebago Lake in Maine and named it Ivy's Cottage after her mother who passed away. So this, again, is a lot of uh, carving away the background and letting the, the design and the letters stand out. And then I painted the entire... Uh, I've made, I think, 17 jewelry boxes over the years, and uh, the tops either have the name of the person or some Celtic uh, design, and that's the uh, inside of the, the jewelry boxes. Um, and then there's the uh, couple of signs I've done for the Irish Cultural Center of Greater Boston in uh, Canton, Massachusetts, and they were. I, I offered to do something, and they said, "Well, I don't, we don't know what we'd like you to. How about uh, we have men's and women's room in this newly newly record uh, reconditioned building?" And uh, so I said, "Okay, I'll do that." So that's what um, I made. There's a candle holder. It's hard, really, again, hard to see the detail, but. Some Celtic sign and uh, an Advent wreath. After many years of not having a wreath in the <laughs> house, I made one for my wife. Anything else? 
That's it. So. How long can you work at a stretch? I'm good for maybe three hours. Three hours. Yeah, at a time. Breaks every so often, or just go straight. No, I usually go straight out, but that's about my limit. You know? Yeah. Sometimes it's two hours. I don't really know. <laughs> and I sometimes I'll come back, depending on how much I want to get some piece done. You know, I might go back. Yeah, I mean that's obviously an issue in doing hand tools. Yeah. Is and depending on the, the hardness of the wood and uh, the sharpness of the tools, it can be a problem. But I'm I blessed. I couldn't carve very well um, without pushing the blade. Um, the guy that I saw carving, chip carving, you know, was doing it totally with the wrist mm -hmm. and the hand. Yeah. And I, and I just didn't feel like I could make a consistent cut. Yeah. Without pushing the blade with my thumb, which is what you were doing. Right. I thought I was cheating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever works, you know. Yeah, it's, no cheating. It's right. one of those things. <laughs> whatever works. I like that. Your gilding, is it with an adhesive or water, oil? What, what kind um, of process? No, it's, I'm using sheets of, of gold, gold leaf, and then you apply the... I haven't done it so, in such a long time. It's the traditional way of of applying gold leaf. Are you right. so sizing or sizing? Yes, yeah, sizing. Right, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, can you mix both power and hand tools? I mean, it's a little, a little, I forget what they call them. Power, t you know, power carving? Micro, yeah, micro motors and power tools. He's wondering if you can mix the hand tool carving and the power tool carving. Oh, like I said, cheating. No, 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 no. This is just just my my take on, on it. But we, we will get to the power the power group. That's honestly one of the biggest lessons I learned was when you first start off, you think things have to be done a certain way, or it's considered cheating. But then you learn very quickly that there's no such thing as cheating. Right. If you don't like the head, you can cut it off, move another one on. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to get around. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. We call well, it surgery. Surgery. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I've, as I said earlier, I, I have never taken a, a class, so I don't, and I think that some, some of these people probably teach it, this has got to be done this way, like the North Bennett School, I think you, I've heard, this is the way you do it. If you don't do it this way, you're out. But, I, I've taken a lot of classes from so-called top people in the field, different types of bird carving, and everybody tells you how to do things differently. Yeah. They all do it a different way than what the other guy does. Yeah. Everybody does. So it's just whatever you feel. Whatever works for you. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good. Good. I just want to see what... And the other thing, too, is about carving knives. You know, that, I mean, I have... I probably have 20 different carving knives, and... Everybody likes a different knife, a different size, or a different group. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no one carving knife that's, that's better than another. It depends on what you feel most comfortable with. Right. Using. Yeah. yeah. So. Everyone, uh, guild member here, I'm assuming. Uh, well, if you are, Bob. The cover of the latest journal magazine that we put out has a feature article that uh, Bob Schwinger mm. had beautiful carvings of fish and birds. Mm. Very well done. Thank you very much. Mm. And if you are interested in, in looking for tools and equipment, I do have a couple of brochures on the back counter of some of the. Vendors, um, the three that I use most are MDI, which is great. I don't know who you use when you're buying knives or tools. Or uh, woodcraft, mostly. Woodcraft. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I told you I went to their, their Newington shop, and they were kind of limited, maybe post-COVID type of thing. I don't know. Uh, but MDI has a great assortment of tools. Um, Treeline is out of Provo, Utah. They have a great assortment. There's another gentleman named Greg Dorrance. He's down in Aboriginal Mass. He bought out Social Mountain. Greg Dorrance, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg Dorrance out of Aboriginal Mass uh, bought out 
um, Smoky Mountain wood carvers, mm -hmm. and he has a huge assortment of hand tools. Um, I know MDI is having difficulty getting some of the dockyard, getting some of the OCC tools and that type of thing. He's able to get flex cut. Um, they seem to have no problem with flex cut, but Greg Dorrance has been able to get some of the other knives. And he has a store that you can walk through. Oh, it's like a candy store. Yeah, <laughs> if you're a wood carver, it's it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, I, to answer your question, I use a combination of wood, of power tools and hand tools. Um, I consider myself when I get into power carving as cheating. Everybody's like, oh, you don't use hand tools, but there is no cheating really. It's the combination of what works better for you. Hmm. Your question about the power tools. I mean, I've got a variety of power tools. Mm -hmm. What would be a microcarver your best tool? Do you think? There are several out there. <coughs> it depends on what you want to do. Um, I have three power carving units. I have a small Fordham, which is a portable. Mm -hmm. It has about 11,000 RPM. And then you can get into the more, a <coughs> little bit larger plug in ones like uh, the um, mm -hmm. Ram over on the back counter there. I happen to have a microcarver. And then this big flex arm carver that, let me grab it out of the drawer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the flex arm carver is really powerful. Um, and if it, it can get away from you, so you do have to be careful. It, it, if it gets away from you, if it goes over an edge, like when you're, when you're power carving, you never want to start here yeah. because it's going to flip back and take off the skin off the back of your arm. Mm -hmm. um, but it works really well for hogging out big stuff. Yeah. And then I use the smaller carver units for the more fine detail. It's also a turbo carver, which... What uh, is it? A turbo carver for doing real fine work mm -hmm. that has a couple hundred, um, a couple hundred thousand RPM. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use that with air pressure. So it really finished stuff nicely. I've had a few in my user demo book. The turbo power? Yeah, there's a specific turbo power. Yeah, I, I see it in the magazine, but I don't yeah. have to use one myself. But okay. um, they're, they're available. Mm -hmm. uh, the most versatile, I find, is the, not the micro power, but the small, the mid size. Uh, Which is like that ram over on the back counter. <laughs> No, not that small. It's a little, I, a little bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, Ram, Ram sells it. Um, it's, it's basically it has the power to, to do um, take quite a bit of material off if you want to rough it. And it's also small enough to do some fine work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, for just when I do detail work, I use a small portable one. A little electric. Yeah, a little. Battery powered one. Hmm. And I take that on trips with me. Uh, I take it on cruise ships and whatever. And uh, if I want to do some farming, I always have a whole bag of stuff with me. Did you get dust in your jacket? <laughs> 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 no, but it's nice to sit on the bench and see or whatever. Uh, on your uh, on your black shant that you want to? Is that a manual card or is that for uh, Which one? The, the flex shaft one that you were That's a Fordham. Fordham? Fordham. Do you yeah. break the, the, I mean, I, I routinely have a back supply of center springs or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. It's a dry center because I'm breaking them all the time. Buddy. I use the Fordham one for decoys, you know, yeah. for bigger work. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, that's a nice, that, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, uh, the air car. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Ford has a uh, reciprocating piece. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I've never tried it. You haven't? I haven't tried it. It looks like you would do a lot of fast work. Uh, I haven't tried it. I, I haven't tried it, to be honest with you. Um, I guess I, I use a, a Jesuit, I guess it's a Jesuit mostly to do, that's my main workhorse that does most of the work for me when I'm doing songbirds and what have you. But, um, and I use, the, before them I use the rough, rough house ducks and then I'll use, then I'll switch back to the Jesuit to do the finish work on it. Um, the Fordham is, is a big piece and if you're going to do, um, you know, with small pieces, it just it gets lost in your hands, and it's too it's damn too damn powerful to 
Power carving too. You you start looking at different types of bits. Yeah, yeah, they are clumsy with that. Yeah. So I can show you. I can show you uh, the the ram tool. I have it out in my out in the corner there. I can show you that if you're interested in it. But uh, what I find, I like it because it's so portable. And then when you start looking at that, you look at different types of bits. You've got the carbide bits. Um, you've got so I start out with the rougher tools that have a larger tooth on them for um, roughing things out and then getting into the finer diamond bits or ruby bits. And you would think these would be expensive, but they're actually not very expensive. You can oftentimes get a set of 10 for like $15 on the diamond bit sets. Um, it has a much finer grain. And then when you get done that, you can also do the power sanding. So you can get different grit sanders that actually go on, so you can do actual power sanding, so you don't have to do as much sanding by hand if you don't want to. Even with the bit sanders, medium fine and, and coarse uh, in the diamonds. And you'll see these little packs of diamonds that, that they give you 20 pieces for, or 10 pieces for 20 bucks. Stay away from them because they're, <laughs> they're junk. I know. Oh, you bought some? Yeah. You can also use dental bits. <laughs> if you talk to your dentist about getting dental bits, um, they'll give them to you because they can use them once, then they autoclave them and throw them yeah. away. So if you're doing very, very tiny, <laughs> fine work, um, it's sometimes dental bits work great. Right. Ruby, sapphire, or diamond? I don't see a difference. No. What do you see, Bob? I don't see a difference. Ruby, Ruby, sapphire, sapphire or diamond maybe. in the bits. Um, I, I, no, I don't see a fine. I, I like using the diamond better than the ruby because they cut better. But um, I sometimes, I, I'll get the coarse ruby uh, and I use that for what I have a lot of material. Not a lot of material, but a lot compared to what I'm going to use the diamond. Right. You can ruby use diamond. Yeah, no, I've got sets of each. I'm just going to, sometimes I'm not sure which to choose. Yeah, they both work really well. Okay. The German diamonds are, are the better ones to get um, because they, they tend to cut better. Um, and as far as, you know, this German diamond, who sells that? MDI. MDI. Yeah. They all, I'm sure they all carry it. Um, and I find that uh, paint remover is the best way to, to clean your blades, to soak them in a little clean. So then use a wire brush after we clean them. Don't leave them in too long. Mm -hmm. And it loosens all the, 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 uh, the sap and everything. It, it just, even though the wood looks dry, it does pick up sap. And what are you using? Paint remover. Paint remover? Hmm. Oven cleaner does. Oven cleaner, Oven cleaner, cleaner does the same job, yeah. Right. Hmm. Almost like a dental tool. Yeah. As I was looking at the brochures over there, I noticed sometimes you can burn, the, uh, well, I don't know what they call it, but Burning instead. Would burn? Yeah. Pyrography? Yeah. Is that yeah, so yeah. part of this or is it something totally different? A lot of carvers incorporate wood burning into their arts. Um, yeah. uh, uh, I use texturing. it for feathers, for doing the quills and feathers. Yeah, there's a term in there, Jal Fester, who uses a, the wood burning to carve. In fact, he came up with his own version. To vaporize higher, wood. yeah, vaporize the wood. It's a higher power. Hmm. I took a course with, um, oh God, what's his name? From Australia, who made one out of a car, a battery recharger. Was the Graham, uh, what's his name? John? Huh? No, Graham Perfect. Prittle. Prittle makes them out of, uh, we took that at Microsoft. Makes them out of, uh, uh, Battery charger, so uh, you can incinerate half a bat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just hear something. I don't know. Be, uh, yeah. I'm just thinking of things in the future. I saw. Yeah. It's called pyrography, and it is incorporated in the art of wood carving. Because I'm thinking, maybe someday I might just see a little bit of that. 
Uh, one thing I've learned is there's no fixed way of doing something. I mean, every any way is acceptable if it, it does the job that you're looking for. And, right. You know, you just have to feel and find what's what's most comfortable for you. Yep. Any other questions? I've got my, uh, the works that you saw up there are mostly in this book, if you'd like to take a look at those afterwards. I do have a question on one of your pieces you passed around, you had the shape of the um, manual, or the picture frame, is that something you did with the machine and then went back and put those marks in to make it look rough or something? Um, I know what you're referring to. That one right there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this one? Here? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I might use a, a router to get down to almost the level I want, so that gives me a, an even depth entirely, and then I just go over with a gouge to tool, tool the uh, finished product, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah.